Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. And today I wanted to make something quite beginner friendly. I think this is a very good beginner drafting project as well as beginning a sewing project because there's not a ton going on here. There's lots of darts, but that's true of anything I make and you need to practice those anyhow. But most of the visual interest on this design today comes from using two different colors of sateen. And of course I couldn't resist throwing some HTV black flock decals on there as well. So you'll see that as we dive into this project. It's a bit medieval, it's a little bit I don't know, Queen of Hearts, which coincidentally kind of aligns with Valentine's Day, which was a complete mistake. So apologies in that regard for being so on theme. Uh, there's no hearts actually involved. It is just black and red. So we are kind of getting that vibe. But let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. As is pretty usual, I'm going to begin with a copy of my basic bodice block pattern. Mine has two darts. I'll go ahead and trace a copy of that, including that dart information so that I can Go ahead and move those around. I'll be using all of my dart fullness in side darts today. So I'll be taking the waist dart and moving it over to the side as well. So I'm gonna draw two lines out from the apex where I want those new darts to be. And I'll just split my waist dart into that. If I really were going to be doing my due diligence with this, I would actually open up both the waist and the side dart and split all the dart fullness evenly between these three darts on the side. But I will just leave the side dart right where it is, only dividing the waist darts fullness between the two new darts. Up here on the neckline, surprising no one, I'm going to do that tipped up, slightly raised neckline that I've been doing so often over the last year or so. So I'm going to come out a half inch along the shoulder seam, up a inch and a half, and curve that down into the shoulder seam and down into the neckline like so. This kind of has a grown on stand collar almost effect, a little bit of a funnel neck, and it's a neckline I've become quite enamored with over the last year or so, like I said. I'll go ahead and cut out the top of this. I'm going to leave a center front seam along the center front of this because I'm going to be splitting this down the middle with color. So one side of my dress will be red and the other side will be black. But here I am transferring that dart fullness again from the waist dart into these two new side darts like so. So closing up this one at the waist so that I can open up those two in the side. You can't create a new dart out of nothing unless you happen to need more dart fullness. Um, when you're fitting things you can, but because my pattern already fits me, the only way for me to create new darts is to use some of my kind of defined dart fullness. So I'm using my waist dart fullness to create these two over here. I recommend watching my darts video if you do not understand darts yet. And hopefully I can convert you to someone who understands darts after that hour long lesson, just all about darts. I know. And here I am drawing in my new dart legs. Now that I have that fullness split between these two new darts, of course, my dart point still needs to come out an inch and a quarter away from my true apex. So I'm going to draw those in there. That way I know where to sew them later. And then in order to get the correct shape along the side seam of this, I will go ahead and fold my darts closed in the paper and cut off the excess. That way I have the correct shape along the side seam as well. So those will close up easily later. And I will cut off extra paper and tape down my floops along the back so that nothing gets stuck and ripped on anything. Because sometimes your floops on the back will get caught on something and rip. And then before you know it, you have to tape your whole pattern back together. Better to just tape now and not have to have that happen, I guess. And I will go ahead and trace a copy of my back pattern same sort of idea here. I'm actually going to leave my dart right where it is. However, I just want to transfer over the neckline adjustments. So the shoulder and uh, back neckline adjustments. I'm going to come about five inches down and tip out a quarter inch along the center back here. This just gives a little bit more room for the like curve up over the back of the neck, I suppose. And then I'll just connect that to my shoulder line here like so. Now we have this grown on collar funnel neck for the back. The more you tip it out of the back, the more it's going to stand away from your neck. Um, I probably could get away with a little bit less, but I always err on the side of making sure there is enough room as opposed to it being too small, I suppose, which I agree is too much of the same vowel sounds. All right. So I have my front and my back. Let's start working on the skirt here. I am going to be doing an A-line skirt for this today, but again, it will need to have a center front seam because I will be splitting the skirt color, at least in the front as well. I didn't have enough red fabric actually in my stash to do the back split, but I was trying to use a uh, some spare sateen that I had here in the sewing room. So I didn't have a ton of red. I didn't have enough to make a whole dress out of red sateen, but I had some red and I had some black. So I thought I would do a split color dress like this today. So I will need a half inch of seam allowance along the center front of my skirt front here in order to split the color. All right. So I'm going to line up my pattern along the center front here. I'm going to use my awl to close these darts and flare the bottom of the skirt, just transferring this dart fullness into flare. I'll put my awl into the point here, close this dart like so, which swings the skirt and trace a little bit more of the hem, trace up to the next dart and close that next dart the same exact way. I do go over this in my A-line skirt video. So if you wanna watch this uh, again and again in a little bit more slow motion, you can go ahead and click on over to that video. I'll put a card up to that A-line skirt video here because I do show this sort of magic pivot method and then also the more classic slash and spreading of the darts method. Both do result in the same exact skirt pattern. And I have had questions about how to do the A-line skirt if you for some reason do not have darts on the front of your skirt, which 
it's perfectly possible that for some reason your basic block skirt pattern doesn't have darts. I would split it into at least three sections, once down the center and then either side of that. And I'll cut that out here. And then you can just add in what is a fullness. If you do have darts on your back pattern, for example, I would do the back pattern the regular A-line way and then just make this flare to match. So add a similar amount of flare that you gained in your back pattern to the front, just splitting it and using um, additional wedges of fullness like this, as opposed to using your darts. You can also do this if you don't get enough fullness from your darts. If you want to have a more flared skirt and your darts don't give you a ton of flare, you can also go ahead and just add flare in here, just drawing lines from the hem to the waist and flaring that out as much as you want. Of course, if you flare it out full 90 degrees, you're starting to get into actually just circle skirt territory, and it's better to just actually draft a circle skirt. But I just went ahead and did the same pivot method to get my A-line skirt back as well. I just needed a fresh copy of this. I don't know where my other copy was sitting, so eh. I still need to make a card version of the top of this pattern since I use it so often for making peplums. But you can see again here how this method is working. This lines up along the center front here. I put the all in the dart point, close that first dart, close that second dart, and that dart fullness has been transferred into the hem to create a flared skirt instead. Now I will be doing a long sleeve on this dress today. One red one and one black one to match up with the bodice. And so I will go ahead and trace a copy of my long sleeve block here, my basic sleeve block, which again, I do have a video about making this, so I can link that in the description below. I'm going to draw across the bottom of the sleeve cap here because I will be adding a bit of flare into this today and I will make sure to draw in my elbow dart. I'm actually going to narrow the sides of my sleeve a tiny bit today too, just because this fabric has a tiny bit of stretch and I felt I could get away with it. But I'm coming out two inches from either side of the center of the sleeve cap here and then drawing that down to the like center point there. And I will use those lines to flare the top of this and add a little bit of puff into the top of my sleeve. This is technically um, making this into a leg of mutton sleeve. So that's um, like a subtle one, not like a huge 80s one, which of course you can add a ton more flair if you want to though. So it's all up to you how much puff you'd like in your sleeves. Right now this has none, but we're about to add some. So I'll cut down from the center to this meeting point and out from there to the underarm on either side. Then I will cut down from the sleeve cap again to this little center point here. And then I can add in as much fullness as I would like. So I want to add in probably at least an inch to an inch and a half of fullness here in the center of the sleeve over the kind of like I don't know, outer shoulder, the meaty bit of the outer arm. I don't know what that's called. <laughs> Anatomy knowledge is lacking here. Um, but right here, I'm going to tape this down. I drew a new center line as a basis for myself here. I'll tape this down and add in about an inch right here is what I'm saying. This is what I'm talking about. So at least an inch here. Probably, I think I'll use an inch and a quarter today is what I ended up with. Yeah, come up another quarter of an inch there. And then I can tape this down and I will distribute the fullness that has opened up along the cap along the cap. So instead of it ha having it all along the center or all along that one split, I will split it between the two. Dang it. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, the good thing is you can see what I'm doing so that you don't have to know what I'm talking about, which is great because hopefully between the two, the visuals and me trying to explain something will become clear. I'm going to raise that sleeve cap a good five eighths of an inch at least, and then blend that in to the rest of the original sleeve cap like so. So I've raised the sleeve cap a little. I've added some fullness over the like top of the shoulder cap in general. So this will gather down into a nice little bit of puff for me, giving a little bit of a stronger shoulder on this garment. It also makes sleeves extremely easy to set in when you have a little bit of puff up here, because when you're trying to set in a perfectly smooth sleeve, any extra puff is a mistake, I guess, and any not enough sleeve is a problem. Whereas if you have a puff sleeve, you kind of can just adjust any little wiggles in the size along the puffed portion. So that is kind of nice. And I'll be finishing the neckline of this dress today with a facing. So I'm just taping together some scratch paper so that I can trace a facing like so. Just tracing my front bodice pattern. <clears throat> and my voice is giving out already. We just got here. Cut it out. And so I can go ahead and trace that in. I want to mark where on that my center front will be. Oh, my computer is making a strange rattling noise. That cannot be good. Um, hold in there, buddy. We, we need you. Um, so I'm going to make this at least two and a half and with this raised neckline, probably at least three and a half inches wide. I like to do a little bit of a wider facing because the neckline does come out and up past where my normal neckline on my block is. So on my normal block, I would do at least a two and a half inch facing for this. I want to do it a three and a half inch facing just because this comes out past the normal neckline on my block. Again, hopefully that makes sense. All right. So I have a front facing here. I need to do the same sort of thing for the back. Just trace a facing. This, you can see, finishes at the center front because I don't need to have a seam on my facing. There's no reason for that. I'm going to make the facing all red so that on the black side, it will show a little bit red on the inside. On the red side, it will match. You'll see what I mean later. I think it's a little bit of a, the same reason that Christian Louboutin puts red on the bottom of their shoes. You know, it is just nice to have that little bit of red 
flash against the black. If you don't have a matching lining in life, might as well do something that's like a contrast on purpose and like add something to the garment, I suppose. But I'll just trace a nice wide neckline facing for the back as well, coming down a little bit further along the center back than I did for the front. And of course I will be doing a center back zipper on this. So I do have a one inch seam allowance on both my back pattern and of course the matching facing. I'll grab that bit of red sateen that's been kicking around the studio and I'll go ahead and cut out my facings on these strange leftover shaped bits of this. So I kind of folded this along the correct grain line at least to be able to have this center front fold in my front facing like so. I will go ahead and serge the outside edges of this. So I'll set this next to my serger. Of course, there are always options on different ways to finish the raw edges of a garment. Uh, my favorite way or like the nicest way that I usually turn to is to go ahead and use round seam binding. Um, I don't usually use that on cotton garments though. I usually use it on lighter weight things or floopier things. Um, silks and rayons. So for something like this in a cotton sateen or a cotton twill, I will definitely use the serger, but of course not everyone has one of those. You can use pinking shears to cut out your pieces that will help with fraying. Something like this cotton sateen actually doesn't fray that much even when you wash it. So depending on the weave of your fabric and how closely woven it is, it'll be more or less of a problem. So although you see me using a serger to encase the raw edges of my pieces, it's not, uh, you know, mandatory. You can go ahead and use pinking shears or seam binding other ways to finish your raw edges. This is going to last through multiple washes, even without that kind of thing, just because again, the cotton sateen is a pretty stable fabric, but for maximum longevity of this garment, I went ahead and ran them through. And I was making sure to label which side up I needed of my garment because I want one side of the bodice to be red and the other side black, and then it to be reversed on the skirts. So I had to kind of make some notes on my pattern pieces to make sure I got that right because there was a right and a wrong side to this fabric. So I wanted to be careful about getting the right side to be red and the left, you know what I mean. And I am cutting these pieces out just on a single layer of fabric as opposed to having it doubled because of course I don't need two of each color. I need one of each color for each piece. Again, hopefully this makes any sense. And once I have everything cut out, I can go ahead and line my pieces back up and make sure I'm transferring my dart markings onto the back side. I'm using a colored pencil and Taylor's chalk for that. Of course, this is another area where you can just do as you feel is best for your personal practice in the sewing room. I use colored pencils quite a lot on the inside of stuff because I don't care if there's marking on the inside of my stuff, especially because half the time I'm lining something, so it'll never be seen. Um, this, the Taylor's chalk will wash away once I wash this dress. The colored pencil may or may not, but it, it really just doesn't matter to me. You can also use white gel pen for this sort of thing. They also have chalk pens and chalk pencils that are specially made for marking fabric during sewing, but eh, I don't really, it doesn't trouble me too much to use colored pencil and I have them on hand, so ready to go. And of course on the front here, I have three darts on each side. So I'll go ahead and again, mark those dart points using an awl to poke um, a hole through my pattern. That way I can position those dart points exactly where they need to be. And then I'll draw in the dart legs with my Taylor's chalk here, just because I had a piece sitting nearby like so. So you can see uh, that original side dart is larger than the other two. So I should have probably redistributed that fullness so that it was even in each dart, but eh, it doesn't really make a difference in the finished garment. Really? Sorry. And like I teased in the beginning of this video, I did go ahead and create a new design to cut out of heat transfer vinyl, in this case, heat transfer flock in black. So I created this design actually off of a plaster work uh, design from the outside of a building in Spain. So I saw a photograph of this building's plaster design over on Pinterest and I thought it was cool. So I went ahead and modified it a tiny bit after tracing it over in Photoshop and ended up creating this design here that I cut out a couple of times for this garment. I used one decal on the front, one on the skirt, and then one on the back as well, just to get a little bit of extra interest going on here. I thought the shape of this was a little bit like uh, shield like, but also iron fence looking. I don't know. I quite liked this design. I thought that a little bit of filigree went a long way with this one. And I can upload this graphic over onto Pinterest. If you are interested in this graphic and using it for anything, feel free. I will link that below.
but I'm just taking my time lining up this design exactly where I want it and ironing everything into place, making sure that HTV is stuck down to my cotton sateen. And again, this is still fully washable, even with the HTV on here, so that doesn't affect the washability of the garment at all, which is always nice for embellishments because sometimes when you have delicate appliques and sequin and beadwork like I tend to sometimes do, then it does affect the washability of something, but this, there's no trouble. And then after I have that on, I can go ahead and pin these last few darts that I hadn't pinned yet because I wanted to go ahead and iron that stuff on. And then I will come over here to the machine and sew my darts. As always, I'm starting at the large end of the dart and sewing up the triangle, off the point, and then I will tie the two threads at the end shut. So I'll leave these a little bit long and just tie them down to the surface of the fabric. Um, so the first knot that I tie, I'm not tying super tight because I don't want to pull any extra tension. I'm just sliding the threads down to the surface and then I can tie a couple more times just to make sure that stays secure. There's many ways to sew and tie off and finish a dart. This is just the way I prefer. Uh, out of the several methods I was taught in fashion school, this is the one that I've stuck with. And after all my darts are sewn, I will bring them over here, of course, and start pressing them into position. I press all my darts towards the center front or center back, depending on if I'm working on the front or the back. Some people press their darts to the side, some towards the centers. Whichever works for you, just keep it consistent. And uh, when I was folding the pattern pieces earlier, uh, something to keep in mind, like if you fold your darts one way in the patterning process, you need to fold them the same way when you're done sewing. So again, which way that they are pressed matters less than just keeping it consistent between pattern drafting and sewing of the entire garment. And you may have spotted during this process that I had one little leaf that was going to overlap the dart, so I left that little leaf of my decal off and ironed it on after the dart was sewn, just to make sure that that all came together smoothly because sewing a dart point where that flock material is layered over the fabric, it would have just been too thick and annoying, so better just to sew the dart first and iron the leaf on afterwards. And for my skirt pieces, because this is an A-line and we closed those waist darts, of course I have no darts to sew, I just want to go ahead and grab some of the lint off of this, because in the sewing room everything gets covered in lint, of course. And I will go ahead and put my decal onto the red skirt front as well. So I made the first one on the bodice about three inches down from the shoulder seam, so I wanted this to be about three inches down from the waist seam and a similar distance from the center seam, just so that it looked planned, honestly. And after my darts are sewn and that HTV is all on where I want it, I will finally go ahead and run everything through the serger, like I said earlier, including the outside edges of my facing pieces. I don't bother to serge the neckline of my facings or the dress itself because it will of course be encased with that facing and is not going to receive much stress. So I never bother to do that just because it's going to add extra bulk with this thread over there that I don't need. I can then go ahead and start sewing this dress together properly. Now that the darts are sewn, everything's kind of prepped at this point so I can start actually assembling the dress itself. I will go ahead and sew my center front seam for the skirt here, and I will do the same for the center front of my bodice pieces as well. Now this I did not mark where this v-neck should end, and we'll see later that I should have. So I was kind of, you know, trusting myself, and it turns out even me. Am I trustworthy in the sewing room? Who knows? Uh, we'll find out later. But I will line up my shoulder slash neckline seams for the facing as well, so I can sew those together, get those clipped and pressed and ready to go onto the rest of the garment later. Just have that prepped. I like to pin as much as I can, set it all next to the machine, sew as much as I can, and you know, minimize trips between the ironing board and the sewing machine, even though it's not very far in this sewing room. Uh, some of you actually commented on um, when I did a sewing room sort of tour uh, last year and said, oh, I didn't realize that room was so cramped. It's like, yeah, it's not the world's biggest room, but I feel very lucky to have it. But I just sewed those shoulder seams on the facings and now I will sew my center front seams that I pinned as well, have those ready to go so I can press them open and move on to the next step. As usual, I'm using 12 stitches per inch over here on the Singer 99K from 1955, and I have some Guterman all-purpose thread threaded into the machine here. Go ahead and press open that center seam on the skirt. Starting to see our color blocking come together already. Like so, and again, somehow I have lint on here already again. Don't fold lots of fabric, uh, aka get lots of white lint everywhere before you start working on a black and red project, I guess is the moral of that story. And here's the center front of the bodice. You can see it's rather shapely with all these darts sewn into place. So it's not laying flat anymore, but that's all right. As long as the side seams are laying flat, and they are, so we can line those up. I will go ahead and pin these side seams between the fronts and the backs, and also the shoulder slash neck seam up here as well. I can sew all four of these at once, no problem there. 
So that will be my next order of operations for the bodice. Now that everything else is together, I can go ahead and sew the main body of the thing together, basically. And then I will sew the backs onto the skirt pieces in a moment here. You'll notice again that I cut both back skirt pieces out of black sateen. That's just because I did not have enough red to do the whole thing. But I do need to clip and press open my neckline seams for that facing as previously discussed. Always clip a curve if you want it to lay smoothly. I know it's nerve wracking, especially depending on how, like the fancier the fabric, the more nerve wracking it is. But if you want something to lay smooth, you're gonna have to clip those seams. It was something that was very much drilled into me and therefore I repeat it often. But yes, with that done, I will go ahead and before I sit back down on the sewing machine, pin my side seams for my skirt as well. And then back here over on the machine, I can sew everything that I just prepped. As far as learning how the order of operations needs to go for any given project, because of course I don't have an instruction booklet, I don't have a sheet telling me what step comes next, and a lot of times things are interchangeable. If I sewed the left hand side and the right hand side of my garments together first along the shoulder and side seams and then sew the center front, that doesn't affect anything, that's totally fine. So a lot of times these things don't have to go in a certain order, but it's you can't sew your side seams until the darts are in because they're all along that side seam. So of course, if I went to go line up my side seam, I would notice, oh, this doesn't match because the darts aren't sewn yet. So it's really about working backwards and making sure, okay, if I'm gonna sew this side seam together, what needs to happen before I can do that and kind of working backwards from there and then forwards. So uh, that's kind of the logic puzzle of assembling things like this dress. Of course, I've been doing this for many years now, over well over a decade. So um, I don't necessarily need an instruction booklet anymore. And there are still times where I get myself into a little puzzle where I sew something together that needed to wait. Um, but luckily that becomes rare and rarer the more things you put together. So as usual, in most things, practice does help. So the more you make, the better you will get at making things, shockingly enough. But yes, pressing my shoulder seams open, again, clipping those curves, pressing my side seams open, and then sewing the other side seam of my skirt, which for some reason I did not pin in advance, probably because I ran out of pins. There's only so many pins. And I do use a lot of them. Some people don't use very many pins at all. Other people prefer clips. If pins aren't for you, that's totally fine. I'm uh, not particular about sewing process. You know, as I always say, we're just trying to make nice clothes in the end and whatever process feels best for you to do that, go for it. Some people prefer all hand sewing. Uh, I'm way too impatient for that personally. And I don't sew, hand sew fast enough to uh, make something in a couple of days like I can when I'm using the machine. So, you know, we all have our own quirks and preferences in the sewing room. And I hadn't sewn my elbow darts in my sleeves yet, so figured I should start constructing these. Once again, give those a quick press, run everything through the serger, that way I can line up my underarm seam here and stitch that into place. And then I'll need to put some gathering stitching up into the sleeve cap as well here. In order to gather that down into the dress, seeing as the dress is almost together at this point, I have to start thinking about sleeves. What an idea. All right. And speaking of that bodice being almost done, let's go ahead and finish that bodice off before I attach the skirt by sewing the facing on. And this is where I realize, oh, I've made a mistake in my center front seam on the bodice itself because that facing did not line up properly. You can see this kind of curves off the edge. I did not sew it perfectly straight. In fact, I need to sew along this white line here. So if I actually line my ruler up and, and draw in my seam allowance where it needs to be, a half inch is a little wider than apparently I think it is. So I need to come up a little bit further on this neckline. That way my facing will match because I started pinning the facing on and realized, hey, this neckline does not line up. So I had to see what had gone wrong and it turned out to be this center front seam. So I just re-sewed that first inch of that or so. And then I can start lining that up with my facing and oh, look, now it fits perfectly. So there you go. There's a little wiggle that I had during this project. And I was like, oh, what, what have I done here? You know, I would never, I would never claim to be perfect. That's for sure. Little things still happen here in the sewing room. Luckily, they're not usually disastrous anymore, but they can still be irritating. And just because I had made that mistake, I went ahead and made sure I drew in my V neckline here and made sure the seam allowance lined up exactly where I wanted it to before I sewed this on, because I didn't want to make an extremely similar mistake twice in one project. And the other sort of misstep on this garment is actually this black sateen. I purchased it at Joann's because this red sateen was purchased at Joann's and I wanted them to be the exact same sateen, same weight of sat sateen. And I like to pre-wash my cotton sateens, so I had thrown this in the wash. And once I started ironing it, once it got it out of the wash, I realized that the salvage looked a little bit different um, because I use cotton sateen from Joann's so often over the last few years that I know what the salvage looks like. And I was like, oh, the salvage looks a little different. Um, and then I noticed, you know what, this might be a tiny bit lighter weight 
the black than the red. And then I was like, did I pick up the wrong sateen? But they only have so many sateens at Joann's and the answer is a few. So I don't know if either they changed the quality of their sateen since I bought the red and now it is a little bit thinner, a little bit not as good quality, I think. Um, so hopefully I just picked up the wrong fabric and they haven't changed their black sateen because I really did like their bottom weights sateen, as they call it. Um, so hopefully nothing has changed over there. Hmm, I don't know. Um, I did find a couple of flaws in this fabric as well. So I don't love this black sateen as much as I normally do. Something about this one was a little off. Uh, because the salvage is different, I know I picked up a different fabric, whether it's because they changed it or because I just silly picked up the wrong sateen. I'm not sure, but I'll have to double check next time I'm out of Joann's. I try not to shop there very often, honestly, um, just because they were not the best to their customers or employees during the pandemic. And I don't appreciate that. And I do like to shop as like, I don't know, semi-consciously as I can, which in this world, eh, is it even possible anymore? But it's not my favorite place to shop, especially because my local one is kind of messy and not very well organized anymore. So it's not even a very nice shopping experience even. But they are the only place I think that has dark red cotton sateen right now. So if you wanted a fabric like this one, I can't recommend anywhere else, sadly, unless you know how to dye fabric, in which case, good for you. Um, I can tie dye fabric. I can't dye fabric into a solid like this. A nice, smooth, even solid. I don't think I could handle it. I just sewed my facing on and I didn't really talk about it, but I sewed that facing on, I clipped my curves, then I just ran that back through the machine and did some understitching along this facing. And now I'm finally pressing it into place. Of course, between clipping it and understitching it, that's gonna make this lay a lot smoother, lay towards the inside of the garment. So that's quite important. Um, always clip that seam before you run it back through for the understitching. I'm just stitching along the facing side edge and making sure I'm stitching the seam allowance down to the facing underneath there. It's kind of hard to see what's happening. But especially in a neckline like this where there's no like shape reason why I can't get into all the little corners and all along the edge, it's important to have some understitching in there. And I will go ahead and tack this later right along the shoulder seam so that facing stays in place there as well. So just making sure I pin that so I know later when I'm sewing the hook and eye above my zipper, for example, I'll go ahead and just throw a couple of stitches to hold that facing down to the seam allowance along the shoulder seam. Now that the bodice is all finished, I will go ahead and sew that to the skirt, matching up that center front first, because of course that's where the colors alternate. And I need to be very careful to make sure that is aligned properly. And having those anchor points sort of lined up and pinned first helps me position myself around the garment as I'm getting everything to fit back down together. Because of course I know I cut it out. I know that I made the pattern. So if it doesn't line up, either I did something wrong in a previous step, which luckily I'm pretty sure that I didn't. <clears throat> Every once in a while though, once again, not perfect. It does happen. Um, so either I like, you know, forgot to add seam allowance if it doesn't line up or the fabric has stretched. And if the fabric has stretched, you can kind of use steam and a little bit of, you know, moving your fingers around on it to make it fit back down into the original orientation. Again, the tighter a weave of fabric is, the less you're going to have to mess with it. I really recommend, especially for beginners, not working with loosely woven fabrics. And the time we come into contact with thread count the most, of course, in sheets where, you know, the finer a sheet is, it's the higher a thread count, which means how many threads are packed into that fabric per inch. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the uh, we weave of a fabric. Is it a tightly woven fabric or is it loose? A loosely woven fabric will have less threads per inch and it's usually floopier and it means that those threads are I mean, moving around, moving around in that space that they have been given. So a tightly woven fabric like a cotton sateen or like a cotton shirting, things like that, they're not going to move around and stretch on you too much unless you're cutting everything on the bias, which is of course a slightly more advanced technique just because bias does like to move around on you and you have to be prepared for that level of movement. Now what's happened here is I lined up my center back uh, of my dress here now that the skirt and the bodice are together. I have not put my sleeves in yet. I'm going to do that last, funny enough, uh, just because it keeps them out of the way, honestly. But I lined up the center back, measured how far down the zipper was going to come along the center back, and then sewed the back shut from where the zipper will end to the hem, because this is an A-line skirt. I don't need to leave a slit or anything like that. And I do have one inch seam allowance along the back here, so I'm pressed open that skirt area that I have already sewn together to have that one inch seam allowance. And now I'm using my hem gauge to press back the seam allowance for the rest of this, the opening where the zipper will be set in. And that all needs to have that same one inch seam allowance. So I'm keeping that consistent as I go here. I shortened my zipper tape by cutting off the little ends of it. And so I was just burning those to melt them because zippers are made of nylon and uh, therefore a thermoplastic fiber that completely is meltable. So if you don't want it to fray, in this case, it's not you don't need to surge it. You don't need to cut it with pinking shears. You can just grab a lighter and just melt the very ends of it. Yeah, be careful. I mean, you know, anytime using flame, 
And that plastic does get hot, so like don't touch it until it's cooled, but you can just melt the ends of that thing. I'm going to be using a lapped zipper insertion technique, and this is my zipper foot over here on this vintage machine. Your zipper foots may vary, of course. Uh, this one is very old, uh, but works perfectly fine. In fact, I find doing zippers on this machine so much easier than on my modern machines, and with the zipper foot, I really prefer it. Um, so I'm sewing the first side of this down, the right-hand side of my zipper, if you're looking at my back, I guess, down to the zipper uh, right next to the teeth, using the zipper foot to get really close. I do have a video all about how I sew my lapped zippers, so if you'd like to see that and have me talk about this in a little bit more detail, I will go ahead and put a card up to that video here. Um, just a little video talking about how I usually put zippers in myself. I was very afraid of zippers for a very long time, and I am finally getting to the point where I've done enough of them that I don't fear them as much, but they are still the most annoying part of the process to me. But once that first side of the zipper is stitched down, I will go ahead and overlap the other folded edge just over the zipper teeth. I always get questions about this affecting the fit. When I say overlap, I don't mean overlap at an inch. I'm talking, you know, minuscule amounts, 1 16th of an inch. This is overlapped along the back of this. You can overlap it a little tiny bit more if you want to and just have that in mind when you're doing your pattern drafting. Include an extra eighth of an inch back here if you want to. Um, if you really want to overlap it further. A lot of people prefer a railroaded zipper or a invisible zipper anyhow but I just prefer a regular nylon zipper with like a regular coil and uh, doing it overlapped. So again, this is another area where whatever you prefer, go for it. And I'll move my zipper foot over to the other side so I can get close to the teeth on this side. Again, I'm going to be kind of feeling where that, those teeth are underneath. And I'm gonna stitch right next to the plastic part of the zipper, I guess, stitching down into the zipper tape, even though I can't see it. But that's all right, won't matter. I am trying to be careful up here at the waist again where this red and black meet each other, really hoping that waist seam lines up. Please, little buddy. All right, and once my zipper is in here, I can go ahead and fold my facing down smooth and cleanly on the inside here as best I can. You can see why I left the facing a little bit long along the center back seam. It's just because the zipper is gonna come up to the top of my back, but not all the way up the top of the back of this collar, I suppose. Um, you can put the zipper all the way up if you want to. Um, I should try it again. I haven't done it in a while. I have been preferring to do some hooks up along the top of this recently. So that's what I'm gonna do here as well. So I've just got the top three or four inches open of the back here. And I will go ahead and put a hook and eye at the top of this. Uh, the other dress that I made, the tie-dye dress that has the same neckline, that's a sleeveless dress. I can link that dress in the description below because I am out of cards. Um, I put three hook and eyes up here and I think that worked better. So I'm going to add some more onto this later because it does gape open a tiny bit over the very back of my neck. So need a couple more hooks back there. But of course I can always adjust the amount of hook and eyes at any point, which is nice. Meanwhile, I do still need to finish prepping my sleeves before I can set these in here as the final step as the rest of the dress is together. Take that zipper foot off the machine, put my regular presser foot back on, and then I can go ahead and put some gathering stitching along my sleeve caps here. I do like using the largest stitch length on this machine, which is six stitches per inch. And I will do two lines of that about an eighth of an inch apart and about a quarter of an inch out from the edge, I suppose, along the sleeve cap here. Two lines of gathering stitching is always better than one in life. Uh, sometimes I am lazy when it comes to sleeves and do one, but you really want to. It helps to be able to distribute your gathers evenly, and if one thread snaps, you still have the other one. So it is nice to not have to like restart the process over again if one of your threads snap. But I'll just line up the underarm seam of my red sleeve to my red side of my garment. This split color method here of construction does help keep the uh, left and right sleeves very separate and uh, easy to not get mixed up because one, you know, the red one goes into the red side, the black goes into the black side. Can't mix that up too much. The nice thing about having an elbow dart in your sleeve too is that you always know what the back of your sleeve is. So that helps, but I will just pin from the underarm seam up towards the shoulder seam as smooth as I can. And then up here, concentrated around the shoulder seam is where I'm going to have all that gathering to fit the rest of the sleeve down. So I'm just pinning the smooth section up to where the gathering threads start and then pulling down the rest of the sleeve to fit. Again, concentrating that gathering up near the shoulder seam. You can also put notches and marks and indications in here. I just keep it concentrated up here and I can see what I'm doing. So I don't really leave myself indications for this, but if you're very concerned about making sure both sides, both the front and the back and both the left and the right are all very consistent and you don't think you can do it by eye, make sure to put some notches in here, leave some pins, indications in there for you. Um, there's no, there's no shame in that. 
Uh, you saw me draw on my neckline with the gel pen earlier. So, you know, whatever you got to do to make clothes, do it. But I'll take this over the machine and go ahead and set in my sleeve. And again, this is the kind of thing where I will stop and start as many times as I need to. I will move little threads and things that are getting caught out of the way. I will move pins if I need to. I'll leave them in if I have to. I'll put my hand into the sleeve, underneath the garment, move little things around as much as I need to in order to get this set in once and not have any puckers or things I don't want to happen, happen. Therefore, I don't have to do that again, honestly. And I will press all my seam allowance out into that sleeve and give it a good bit of steam from the outside, sticking my tailor's ham in there to help all that seam allowance kind of get coaxed into the sleeve where it is less bulky and helps actually puff my sleeve out, which is nice. And of course I had set my other sleeve, the black sleeve in the same exact way. And I just need to worry about hemming those sleeves. I'm actually going to just turn these up at about an inch and a half today and stitch them down just to preserve the little bit of stretch in this fabric by not adding anything not stretchy into the mix basically. So I'll just turn those up a healthy hem and then stitch them into place. But for hemming the skirt, I am going to use some actually pre-made bias tape here. I only ever use the pre-made like purchase, pur purchasable, purchasable, whether that's a word and whether I can say it, both are up for debate. Purchasable bias tape. Um, usually I make my own bias tape out of whatever fabric I'm using or something lightweight that I have on hand. I happen to have this dark red bias tape and I was like, I'm just going to throw that on there. This stuff that you get, the packaged dritz, bias tape is actually a poly cotton blend and is a little bit on the heavier side. So I would never use this on like a lightweight, like air, think of like an airy, very light cotton summer dress. I wouldn't use this bias tape. I would make bias tape out of a lighter weight voile or um, even a poplin, a lightweight, something is going to be lighter weight than this. This is almost a like quilting weight cotton that they make this out of because most people are using binding on. That's right, quilts. So, you know, Although this would be a very narrow binding for quilting. But basically what I've done here is I've stitched one side of the double fold bias tape to the outside of my garment, right sides together. And now I'm flipping everything to the inside, giving that a press and on a curved hem, hemming with bias is your friend. It really is the easiest way to hem anything shaped curved like this. I highly recommend it for circle skirts as well. So hemming with bias is something you see me do quite often. And I did put some hook and eyes in here along that center back neckline area, right at the top of the zipper and then right at the top of the neckline. I need a third one in between. So I'll just do that some other time. And here's how my hem on the sleeves came out. I did go ahead and use red thread to hem the red side and black thread to hem the black side so that my thread would be nice and hidden. So even when I was hemming the skirt here, I switched colors of thread just so that those little tiny stitches on the outside would be as invisible as possible. Here is my finished black and red sort of nightcore tunic inspired dress. Perfect for again watching a joust or two, visiting medieval times for lunch, popping into Disneyland perhaps for a couple of rides on the Fantasyland carousel, or is that just me? I'm really happy with how this came out, even if the black sateen was a little different than the one that I'm used to. I don't know if I just grabbed the wrong sateen at Joann's or if they just really have lowered the quality of it. Let's hope it was the first. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this project came together today and thank you as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon, so I'll see you then. Bye!